thanks so much for joining us tonight for our annual meeting. We're so excited that you could be here. Um, just a few little housekeeping notes. If you have a question during the course of the presentation, you can use the chat um, and we'll do our best to try to answer them at the end. Um, and at some point in the night, we'll have a voting on our slate of board of directors. And that also you can do your voting in the chat. So make sure you get your chat ready um, because you may need to use it. Um, and then I think that's all of my announcements. I'd like to just introduce Dave Birchinoff, our president, and he will kick things off. Great. Well, welcome everybody. On behalf of the board and staff of our great organization, thank you for joining us this evening. Thanks to you, our loyal supporters, we continue to make great progress with our mission of conserving forever the lands and waters of the Finger Lakes region. Despite the pandemic, which is now what, two and a half years into it, I guess, um, we, uh, our progress hasn't slowed one single bit as you'll hear in Andy's report a little later on. Uh, first of all, though, we have a little business to attend to tonight. So I wanna start by introducing Bill Eggers of the Finance Committee, and he will give you the organization's financial report. Thanks, Dave. Um, so I'm gonna start with our operating expenses, which were up only 1% over last year to 1,525,000. It actually was below budget due to constraints on events and programs the, as a result of the COVID issues. So travel and conferences spending was below budget. Items that were above budget were the addition of a land steward part-time to help with our land, our stewardship programs. Uh, one current member of the staff was moved from part-time to full-time. Otherwise the staff numbers were unchanged. Uh, there were some additions to laptops so staff, staff could work remotely or in the field. And we added to social media, media and advertising spending to advance the campaign, capital campaign, and to promote the big projects such as Bell Station. Uh, turning to operating revenue, we had a banner year with revenues up more than 18% compared to the prior year to the record total of 1,878,000,000, uh, 1.878,000,000, an increase of almost 300,000. And we attribute those results to several leadership gifts in support of operations and a record number of members supporting our work. And the capital campaign had an, a positive influence on annual giving and we believe that will continue into the coming year. Turning to some balance sheet highlights, our bank accounts uh, currently are a million five in four banks, uh, but I would note that 800,000 of that sum will be used uh, rather promptly for two pending projects. So we consider our bank accounts as having roughly 700,000 at present, and that is consistent with our policy to have a six month reserve in our ready cash. Our intermediate accounts consisting primarily of treasury bills and bond funds amount to $4.2 million. These are land funds, unallocated campaign funds and reserves for future projects. Um, we also have a legal defense account that is 320,000 intended to cover any legal contingencies in defense of our preserves and our conservation easements. As the number of our preserved acres continues to grow, uh, the board expects that we will add to this account uh, at least modestly in the next years. Our stewardship account, this is our endowment amounted to 8.647 million at the, uh, at the present time, that is up 9.2% compared to last year. But that increase does reflect the action of the board to add to the add campaign funds to the endowment, which we are currently doing using monthly investments. And we expect to continue to do that over the balance of this calendar year. 
the investment performance itself has been down with the market. And as people on this uh, call likely know, the market has been, uh, been quite bad for the last six months. Our performance of our endowment is comparable to any uh, 65, 35% allocation fund. Um, and that would be roughly down 3% over the past year. And that concludes the financial report. So back to you, Dave. Good, thank you, Bill. Um, all righty, now uh, let's see, I want to do Kristen Swain, the nominating committee, and she is going to propose the new uh, board member um, slate. That's new and people whose terms are up and um, we're electing them for their second or third term. So Kristen, it's all yours. Thank you, Dave. <clears throat> the proposed candidates are Lyndon Archer from Ithaca, for his first three-year term. Amy Allen from Skenny Atlas for her first three-year term. Karen Merriweather from Hammondsport for her second three-year term. Lindsay Ruth from Fayette for her third, third three-year term. And myself for my third three-year term. So on behalf of the Nominating and Governance Committee, I make a motion electing this slate. Right, you hear a second? I second it, Dave. Thank Let's you, go. Bill. <clears throat> now, uh, everybody uh, should have had an opportunity to vote either by mail or online, but if you haven't and would like to, you can do it on chat and uh, Let's move right into it. We'll give you maybe a minute or so um, to see if we have anybody else voting. Does that make sense? All right. Okay. Looks like we have a lot of support for the slate of candidates. <laughs> it's a good slate. I would say it's approved. All righty. Well, thank you everybody who voted. The measure passes and uh, uh, my personal welcome to, and thanks for uh, all the new and repeat board members. Um, all right, now to the guy who doesn't need any introduction, Andy Zepp, um, or obviously our executive director, and uh, uh, he's got a few things to say. Take it away. Great, thanks, Dave. And uh, before uh, telling you a bit about some of the projects we're working on, the accomplishments of the past year. I first want to introduce uh, an award we give every year that is really a privilege to do so because at the Land Trust, we couldn't exist without our volunteers. Whether it's the newsletter, you see the articles, the photography, taking care of the land, the fundraising, you know, the governance, uh, the guidance we get, it's just, uh, an incredible commitment of uh, time, effort, and talent. So every year we do give this award, and I would like to introduce our Director of Stewardship, Chris Olney, who is, uh, much of his work involves, we, we have a dedicated stewardship staff who are quite talented, but we couldn't possibly take care of all of our holdings without volunteers. So I'm gonna turn it over to Chris to introduce this year's Volunteer of the Year. Huh? Chris, it looks like you're muted. Muted. Chris, Chris is having a little technical difficulty with his Zoom right now. This is late breaking news. Wait, he's going to try. So hold on a second, everybody. The wonders of technology. 
Chris lives next to the Schuyler County line. It's where Tompkins and Schuyler <laughs> line up. There's this strange void. Uh, but lately, there have been reports that the pilots who disappeared in the Bermuda Triangle. <laughs> they may have come after Chris. <laughs> He's now moved on my screen, but he remains muted. He does. Um, He's back on. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, here he is. is. <laughs> I apologize for that. I only just heard the first words. For some reason, my uh, laptop was not giving me any sound at all. Um, <laughs> Am I on for the award? Yes, <laughs> yes. I just introduced uh, the award, you, and uh, the fact that you live at the edge of a dead zone. <laughs> right. Thank you. I'm sorry about that. But Bill, we'll uh, have to check the budget to make sure we have enough money to get Chris uh, maybe a new <laughs> laptop. <laughs> Got to fix that laptop. Uh, so I, know I didn't hear all of what Andy said as a little preamble, but um, Nellie Farnham and her partner, Jack Booker, um, are tremendous um, friends and supporters of land conservation. Uh, not only have they donated a conservation easement on two separate but contiguous parcels, they then donated that land to the land trust uh, to benefit our conservation work, um, a vehicle, a riding lawnmower to support our stewardship work. So just very generous uh, givers and supporters of our organization. Uh, but I'm here to talk about volunteerism. Um, Nellie and Jack both uh, became volunteers of ours um, a number of years ago as conservation easement stewards. Uh, once they put easements on their land, they kind of um, you know, knew how easements worked and, and felt like they could be ambassadors for the land trust and help us um, make visits to other properties and, and check on things. And they've done, they did that for a while. Um, but Nellie really um, went above and beyond when she um, contacted me in 2013 to let me know that she had some extra time uh, to volunteer and kind of a particular interest and background in planning and, um, you know, looking carefully at documents and thinking through, um, you know, how, how things are managed. And she offered to help me with nature preserve management plans. And that's, you know, not the sexy thing that people normally want to volunteer to do. You know, usually you think you're going to be out there with a pair of loppers and work gloves. Uh, but Nellie wanted to help with planning. And, and that was a huge, huge um, benefit to me because planning is something that we do need to do for all of our nature preserves. And um, with a lot of preserves, we have a lot of, you know, documents to work on. And uh, not only for new preserves, but as preserves age and change, we try to keep those plans um, modified and up to date and revised from time to time. Um, and that maybe it sounds easy to some people, but looking backward in time over sometimes many years to kind of see all the changes that have occurred, all the management activities, looking at the species that have been logged, um, some of the problems and threats to preserves and just kind of synthesizing all that change um, and, and just kind of writing about what's gone on, but then also turning to help look forward, you know, what do we want to do in the future? And um, Nellie worked on eight different management plans and, and that's countless hours of time going through files and then drafting uh, language and, and you know, text about different aspects of a nature preserve. Um, so it was it was really huge commitment of her time to work on those for me and hand me a draft that I could then, you know, finalize and bring to our preserve management committee for review and approval. Speaking of the preserve management committee, Nellie joined that about five years ago and has been a great member and contributes her time in that capacity as well. So um, just very grateful for all the time and, you know, thoughtful input she's provided uh, for me specifically and for the preserve management program. Um, and it's just, it's so, um, uh, it's just so gratifying when we have volunteers who, who are so generous um, and helpful and giving and supportive of conservation. So with that said, I want to uh, just uh, show this little token of our appreciation that we're going to give to Nellie when I see her in person next. This is the special edition of a Sand County Almanac. Um, and uh, I think Nellie is on this call and may want to say a few words, Nellie. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I'm very honored. I, I first learned about the land trust actually from Carl Leopold in the um, about the mid nineties and when he used to eat at the vet school um, faculty lounge. But, but when I was uh, ready to retire, I contacted a, another vet colleague of mine, to, um, Tom Reimers, who all of you surely know, and I asked him how, what he found fulfilling about um, doing as on a volunteer basis in retirement. And as you know, he's, he contributed phenomenally to the land trust, but kind of going back to what Chris said, I knew that I wasn't going to be chopping trees and, and blazing trails and, and that sort of thing. But Tom said, there's lots of niches. F find um, you know, what you find is interesting. And the opportunity came to help with these um, update of management plans. The management plans, had all, there always had been an original plan. And then there were the series of files that went with those plans that had accumulated for either five years or 20 years. And um, it was really um, a, a nice opportunity. And so I started with the Getches um, Preserve because that's one of my favorite and close to where I live. Um, I went to, did another one, um, the Etna Preserve, which is close to where I live. I learned about the King Preserve, which was close to where I lived and didn't even know it. <laughs> um, and then some of the really iconic ones like the Sweeler and Ellis Hollow, which seem to have just come together as if they were, were, were meant to be preserves. And then th there were some that I uh, refer to um, as, as with a medical background as dystocias, ones that really had difficult births where with all sorts of contraindicating things happening at the same time. And I think the McElroy preserve is a good example of that, a, a, a wonderful preserve, but still the, the uh, people who live around the pond the beavers and the land trust are in this sort of uh, uh, perpetual triangle of who is actually um, in control of that land. But I think my favorite to do was the Bahar. The, the original plan had been written in 1999 and the revision was being done in 2018. And so that's almost 20 years to be able to see what had happened at that particular um, um, preserve. And um, it, it started with, and it, I think it really exemplifies all that the land trust does when they get a new um, preserve. It was the first, as many of you certainly know, it was the first preserve on Skinny Atlas Lake to have public access. It was, it was actually the second, second place because the only other one was at the north end of the lake. And that certainly um, was a, a novel idea for Skinny Atlas Lake. The town of Niles was always, from my viewpoint of reading files, incredibly supportive. And the land trust showed incredible patience and perseverance in, in, in handling the multiple issues that, um, that we, uh, were important to the people who lived on that side of the lake um, with their new neighbors. Um, the whole issue of, um, swimming and whether swimming would be allowed and, and the kind of irony that if you arrived in a canoe, you could swim, but you couldn't swim from the shore I and mean, kind of interesting things. Later on, as you all probably know, Carpenter's Falls was um, added. And if you know Carpenter's Falls, that's a good example of an attractive nuisance where young folk had long had beer parties and that sort of things. And, and so that I learned from that the complexity of when the land trust decides to um, re really wants a piece of land, but it's better that it be partnered with the state and how to share this kind of dual ownership, dual responsibility, the liabilities associated with that, um, a, a very interesting sort of um, thing. What I love about it is there's a, if you've been there, there's a path called the old jug path and so this has a lovely history in prohibition that was the path used if you were carrying your jug up to the illegal um, distillery up on the top. And um, so it, uh, it, it is certainly a place that has um, history associated with it. Probably the most inspiring thing about that preserve for me is the old growth forest, which is um, has uh, uh, chestnut trees, which have won beauty prizes. <laughs> They're so, um, um, magnificent and a cabin in the, in the, the center, which I think anyone would love as a, a, 
as a getaway. And then of course, the work that is being done there now with the um, hemlock um, woolly adelgid, another example of something that goes on at, uh, at many preserves, but is especially important um, at this one. So I think since even since this last update in, what did I say, 2019, there have been other um, additions. And every time Andy shows one of his maps of where the preserves are, where the conservation easements are and, and so forth, I think of that Andy and Chris must have been as little kids, jigsaw puzzle lovers. <laughs> and, and I can see them sort of as a little kid, they're missing a piece in that jigsaw puzzle and somehow they have to find it and put it in and make it a uh, whole. And I think these, this whole area around Skinny Atlas uh, really shows that kind of perseverance and, um, and foresight that is so exemplary of the land trust. So to have been part of it in this um, um, capacity has been very enjoyable. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. Yeah. Nellie, thanks so much. Uh, we appreciate everything you do and we look forward to continuing to work with you. So. <laughs> thanks. So speaking, Nellie is absolutely correct in uh, talking about Skinny Atlas Lake or the south end of Canandaigua Lake or the emerald necklace around Ithaca. We do think of jigsaw puzzles and uh, <laughs> we're trying not to just protect individual parcels of land, but actually intact landscapes. So we're gonna shift gears for a moment. If you bear with me just a second, I'm gonna put on a PowerPoint here and let you know how we've done in our puzzle assembly. Okay, do you see a blue lake with forest on the shore. Looks I'm hoping great. you do. Well, it's been a big year and uh, this is the biggest project of the big year. Uh, this is a view of Bell Station on Cayuga Lake. If you've gotten our e-news or read the newsletter or press release, uh, this has been a monumental effort, not just for the land trust, but many local citizens, elected officials, even involving the governor stepping in to get NYSEG to stop an online auction. And uh, it worked. Uh, this is a great example of how things can happen when the community gets engaged and steps up. So uh, Bell Station was acquired to be a nuclear plant 60 years ago under either con uh, condemnation or the threat of eminent domain. I'm not sure which it was, but this was eight different properties spanning um, almost 500 acres that was assembled into a block of land for a nuclear plant that was never built. So we, we pursued it in partnership with New York State for about the last 10 years. And as of last Friday, at the end of the uh, access road, you will be greeted by this sign that uh, we opened it to the public. Uh, there's a network of woods roads and what's its most significant feature is 3,400 feet of level shoreline, much of which is traversed by an old rail grade. So it's an easy walk along the lake. Now I mentioned we're doing this in partnership with the state. Uh, this has um, long been a state priority through a combination of tapping our opportunity fund, our revolving loan fund, to which we raised an additional 500,000, as well as a $2 million loan from the Park Foundation, we were able to make this project happen. But we're only an interim owner because in the future we will be transferring this to the state Department of Environmental Conservation which is going to manage it as a new wildlife management area. And then by prior agreement, based on interest of the town and the state, there are some agricultural fields that we're exploring uh, how to utilize about 200 acres for what we hope would be a model compatible solar and agriculture project. But uh, at this point, we have more questions than answers on that, so stay tuned. This is a view of the shoreline. Um, again, unlike some other sites on the lake, it is level. And that means uh, for the year or two that we own it, we've got a, a, a new challenge in that this is quite accessible. When Nellie mentioned those teenagers, those pesky teenagers at Carpenter's Falls, well, if you're a Lansing teenager, you go to places like this. And it's not being there that's the problem, it's the, the late night drinking and litter and vandalism. So 
we're going to be working with the uh, other local residents and try to ensure that this is accessible for uses like bird watching and kayaking and dog walking and fishing, but to put a lid on the uh, late night partying. Um, it also uh, has some really interesting waterfalls. Uh, right now, uh, until it rained today, I guess, very low flow, but interesting geology. Uh, this is a designated Tompkins County unique natural area. And um, we, uh, our stewardship team was amazing. Uh, within a week of us acquiring the site, uh, trash was cleaned up, drainage improvements were made to the old woods roads. And then this, uh, I would love to see in video because the road, the end of the public road is not particularly close and the access is not particularly good, but this is a footbridge that was donated uh, for the cost of materials by a class at SUNY ESF. It was transported to Lansing and then the two pieces of equipment you see, one at either end, carefully drove this 20 foot bridge down to the old grade, rail grade to replace uh, you know, what had been a rail uh, bridge previously. So um, lots going on at Bell Station. Uh, check out our website if uh, you need directions to get there. And uh, also we'll be leading some additional trips. So it's a, it's a wonderful resource for the community. And that wasn't all in Lansing. Um, earlier in the year, we acquired just by coincidence, another project we've been working on for years, a 200 acre parcels we call Cayuga Cliffs. This is the view from above. It features uh, more than 4,000 feet of uh, shoreline. So together those two projects in the same town, we secured over 7,000 feet of shoreline. Uh, for those of you who've ever been to Gigantic Falls State Park, this is the view directly across the lake. Uh, we're now in the inventory and assessment stage. This, unlike Bell Station, this is a preserve we will keep and manage. So we're looking at careful design of a trail system, uh, looking at public access, which will uh, be from State Route 34B, and also looking at management options for the, the open fields that are located on the property. Jumping over to Skinny Atlas, um, the south end of the lake, we call the Skinny Atlas Highlands, and this is a focus area, one of a, a handful in the region where we are really uh, investing our effort and trying to be proactive to secure the entire south end of the lake. And we now own in this view from Vincent Hill Road at the Onondaga Cortland County line. From this point north, we own two and a quarter miles of, of ridge line. And we continue to add to that. And you can see here's what it looks like on a map. Uh, we've managed last year to connect the Hinchcliffe family and High Vista preserves and construct a hiking trail to connect them. We now added some additional buffer and habitat in this designated important bird area, that purple parcel. And uh, just to your right though, you see the uh, tan colored properties. And that is a conservation easement we purchased from the Franklin family with funding from the New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets. So the earlier photo was just to your left, a little bit downhill, and here's a view of Skinny Atlas Lake and the Franklin farm. Uh, this is the uh, third farm we've secured in this area, and I'm pleased to report we're now working on the fourth. So looking again, not at protecting isolated parcels, but in this case, about 2,000 acres of productive farmland that is also adjacent to this network of nature preserves. Jumping to the west, it was also uh, a great year for enhancing public access to nature. This is a view from our Canandaigua Vista Preserve. Uh, we've been working on another project uh, for a number of years. Uh, this is in the town of Canandaigua, which is really looking at uh, dramatically increasing growth and dramatically increasing land costs. So this was a rare opportunity to protect uh, land that is quite scenic with terrific views, but also has diverse habitat and the, um, the headwaters of uh, Barnes Gully, which goes into Onanda Park down on the lake. And we're now working with the town to connect uh, these two conserved parcels along the gully. Just south of there, uh, we also added land to the Stid Hill multiple use area, a, a ridge top area that we bought about 70 acres in the Canandaigua watershed. This spans uh, down into uh, Bristol and near the Bristol Mountain Ski Resort. 
We see on the right several conservation easement properties, and we're looking to add to them as well during the coming year. And then uh, another focus area of the land trust, the beautiful south end of Canandaigua Lake. Activity there continues where we worked with the Decker family, uh, you know, in the center of the screen on what we call South Hill or the Whaleback, uh, you know, one of the largest um, natural landscapes adjacent to a Finger Lake. We, um, they donated a conservation easement that will secure lands adjacent to state uh, wildlife management area lands. And then toward the back of the photo, you get a glimpse of Bear Hill where we completed, I'm not even sure if it's our ninth or our 10th land purchase where we're adding to Bear Hill State Unique Area. And then we began the year almost about a year ago, we acquired the mouth of Clark Scully, which is a stunning gorge and a popular recreation uh, destination on the south side of what I just showed you, South Hill. And it's also the uh, spiritual birthplace for the, for the Seneca Nation. And we had a wonderful trip out there with probably 40 members of the nation who came all the way from Tonawanda and the Buffalo area uh, to, to visit the site. Uh, further west, uh, we did a great easement, conservation easement project on a stream called uh, Reynolds, Reynolds Gully. Uh, this is in the Hemlock Lake watershed, uh, which is a drinking water supply for the city of Rochester. This is a beautiful trout stream. It also borders state parkland and is part of a, what we hope is a growing green belt out in the western Finger Lakes. Jumping over to Cayuga Lake, uh, we were delighted to have the opportunity to work with Bill and Gail Shaw on their property uh, located on the Cayuga Lake Scenic Byway and bordering Cayuga Lake and with uh, several beautiful waterfalls. This is just a bit north of Camp Barton uh, and just a stunning property. Now, I, I focused on these land acquisitions, but several years ago, with the advent of these harmful algal blooms or toxic algae, uh, the organization realized that we had to do more than just uh, secure the land. We had to work with partners, including our lake association, soil and water conservation districts and others, to start to restore our streams and wetlands and to reduce the runoff, particularly nutrient loading of phosphorus and nitrogen into the lakes. And this is a small stream, but it's, it's indicative of a broader problem in the Finger Lakes. You see on our Van Riper Conservation Area on the west side of Cayuga Lake, this small stream that was highly altered. And most Finger Lakes have a ring of state highways that are typically built in many areas on a hillside where there used to be a variety of small streams and sheet flow whenever it rained uh, heading down toward the lake. Well, with these roads, typically there are culverts here and there, but it, it focuses all the runoff and increases dramatically in streams like this, the velocity so they get scoured out. Uh, and this was contributing tons of soil and nutrients to the lake each year. So we partnered with the US Fish and Wildlife Service and the Seneca County Soil and Water Conservation District as part of a restoration effort that you can see in the coming months how it turns out. But the whole notion here is to restore a more natural riffle and pool system, which requires actually raising the grade of the screen. So they, we, this involved a, a bit of an artist with an excavator who would take these trees and rocks and place them as if they were pickup sticks. It was quite amazing. And again, going back and trying to really um, channel the energy of the stream so it's not scouring downward, but just gradually releasing grade. And if you go to the Van Riper uh, Preserve uh, today, you'll see it's, it's, a, it's a seasonal stream. So probably fall is the better time to go unless it's a thunderstorm, but uh, it has been restored. We're doing some plantings there of native uh, shrubs. And uh, it's, it's really quite remarkable uh, from you know, what it was. We will be having kind of a field day for those that are interested with folks from Fish and Wildlife to explain the whole process probably in September. Uh, down to the south, another focus area, the Shemung River. Uh, if you've never paddled it, the stretch between uh, um, East Corning and West Elmira is just uh, spectacular. 
Uh, here we completed the establishment of a public conservation area, about a thousand feet of shoreline, partnering with the town of Big Flats. And you're looking across the river there at our Kehoe Nature Preserve, where we're now tending about 700 native trees and shrubs that were planted in a field that was primarily invasives before as part of a, a riverside restoration effort. Uh, down uh, to the east, uh, we also bought uh, Tufts Island, which is somewhat ironic. It's two islands you see there. Great habitat for uh, bald eagles, freshwater mussels. This is right outside the village of Owego. And uh, uh, that was acquired during the past year. And away from the lakes and waterways, our region has been blessed with um, a kind of a rewilding of our, our hill country, where the forests have returned, black bear have returned, fishers have returned. And we have an opportunity, if we're able to maintain the connections, to uh, create a network of conserved lands that is viable in the face of climate change and allows movement of species, not just in our region, but one that would connect to the east to the Catskills, ultimately the Adirondacks, and to the south to Pennsylvania. So in, uh, in the Hill Country, we have been working, particularly at sites like the Emerald Necklace in Ithaca, and we'll continue to do so. Um, so here at Hammond Hill, for example, uh, completing a conservation easement project uh, that uh, will secure land adjacent to the state forest and involves restoration of a branch of the headwaters of Owego Creek. Uh, over in Cortland County near Creek Peak, we completed three uh, synchronized conservation easements with three different families, a, uh, a incredible amount of work on the part of our protection staff but you can see the importance of the location of these lands in an area where Greek Creek is, is creating some subdivision demand. And this is located both adjacent to the Finger Lakes Trail and in the midst of this state forest. Uh, in the Emerald Necklace, uh, we acquired a, a, a modest size, but very important parcel on route, State Route 13, bordering our Tap and Mitra Preserve and um, Robert Treeman State Park. This is uh, well known as an informal access point for the Finger Lakes Trail, where it's not uncommon to see 15 cars parked there, even though it was private property. But this was zoned industrial, and it's flat as a pancake. So we were concerned that this view of the trail could become entirely covered by a warehouse. So uh, we, we dug deep and uh, paid a premium for this industrial zone property, 133000 but it, this property will be touched by more people in the future than by many, many other uh, much larger properties. So we're now working um, on formalizing that parking area and uh, that will be completed by the end of the summer. Now, as we, uh, in terms of public access, I do wanna mention that in the Finger Lakes Trail really is a focus, a recreational corridor that knits so many conserved areas together. And as um, we're speaking tonight, we're also completing um, enhanced public access in uh, Eastern Tompkins County, where uh, we're actually partnering with New York State Department of Environmental Conservation and building a parking lot at Potato Hill State Forest because it's right adjacent to our Summerlin Farm Preserve and actually has a better site uh, for the parking lot. And uh, because of the backlog of state work, it's something we're doing uh, you know, just to get it done. And uh, that should be complete soon. And then also uh, at the Eberhard Preserve, which was donated to us in the town of Caroline, uh, a parking lot was recently completed and we're working with the Cuga Trails Club and the Finger Lakes Trail Conference there to reroute the Finger Lakes Trail through that preserve and what will be a secure site. Shifting gears, I wanna talk a bit about restoration. Uh, once these lands are secured from development, we face huge issues. We've got way too many deer uh, eating our native plants. And every day it seems there's a new invasive species of some sort. Uh, these are both things we're not just, we are grappling with, but every conservation agency. Uh, this is a view of our Owasco Bluffs Preserve and just wanna highlight a, a good news story. This was taken several years ago before we had a parking lot or a trail. And what it shows is the US Fish and Wildlife Service had already mowed part of this field that was totally overgrown with uh, primarily invasive buckthorn, uh, something about head height. And this, isn't, this shot 
just gives you a glimpse, but you're looking back across the same area, which is now a field. And there are two things I want to highlight. One is this kind of uh, very appealing ephemeral wetland that is doing just what it's supposed to do. And, and these, these seasonal wetlands are important for two reasons. One is they um, capture runoff that otherwise previously went straight into the lake. And what you're seeing is um, the algae growing on all the nutrients that whether it's from an adjacent farm field or the septic systems across the way, that that is settling out and the water is going back down in the groundwater, not being flushed the, the same day as the event into the lake. The other thing is that they estimate we have had a decline of 30% of our bird populations. And we've also, the, I haven't seen the data, but there's a real concern about insect population decline, which if you're an insectivorous bird, I would assume they're somewhat related. And the other thing this, this uh, little vernal wetland does is produce bugs. It produces food for birds. So we've seen uh, bird use. And then behind is the story I really want to highlight is the buckthorn is gone. And I was just out there about a week ago. And this little guy was nesting in that field for the first time. And the bobolink is a bird of uh, special conservation concern. It nests in grasslands. It has two problems, major problems. One, we don't have a lot of grassland. And two, if you're a farmer, you want to get an early cutting of hay, which does not synchronize well with the nestlings in, in the, uh, the bobolink family. Uh, so we're restoring habitat like this. Lindsay Parsons, our terrific volunteer, John Smith, has done a remarkable job. We've confirmed they've returned there. And Owasco Bluffs, they've expanded their habitat and looking to do that at other sites as well. By the way, they migrate to our area from Argentina. So they're truly a long distance flyer. Uh, one great thing uh, that is happening is our field trips are back. Uh, this year, uh, after COVID limited our ability to offer public field trips, check out the website. Uh, we really are expanding around the region, different educational opportunities, some for adults, some for families, uh, a lot going on. So check out the website for that. This is at our Lindsay Parsons Preserve, where this is one of the views. We have a um, uh, overlook that over this heron rookery that's active right now, accessible to all. Uh, so it's um, you know, easily accessible and encourage folks to check it out if they haven't seen it. And this project uh, has not yet been announced, but some good news uh, that we'll be telling folks about next week is, uh, the estate of the late Margaret Bald has donated her property to us, which is adjacent to Robert Treeman State Park near the upper entrance. And it features two things. It features 140 acres of uh, land with considerable road frontage that's consider, uh, contiguous to the park that otherwise would have been definitely developed. And this remarkable 200 year old fieldstone house that is definitely need of some tender love and care and restoration. So the land trust is going to um, sell the house to someone to restore it with some restrictions on um, how, uh, you know, maintaining some of its characteristics along with the generous three and a half acre lot. And then um, here you can see how this property relates to Robert Treeman State Park. We're going to be uh, start a planning process involving state parks and the Cayuga Trails Club to, on one hand, figure out the best approach for long-term conservation in terms of ownership and management. And on the second hand, to create a connecting trail from the Finger Lakes Trail kind of in the east at, through this property and reconnecting to the Finger Lakes Trail in the west so to add some recreational opportunities there. So uh, more on this to come, but a, a, you know, a wonderful opportunity to protect land that also is in the watershed <laughs> for uh, Enfield Creek, which is a beloved swimming hole and one of the most popular in upstate New York. So it'll help maintain water quality. Now, before wrapping up, this is a bit of a bittersweet um, event because um, we will be losing our this year's leader, Dave Birchinoff, who has been our president for several years now and has capably led us through uh, thick and thin. 
And then his predecessor, also of Skinny Atlas, Holly Gregg, featured here. They are both be leaving the board, uh, reaching the, the term limits. And I just want to acknowledge and thank both of them for you know, their tremendous accomplishments over the years. And I want to also um, just mention that some people may be aware uh, that Holly uh, made his living as a professional musician for some period of time. But some don't know that he was also a stunt double for the actor Sam Elliott. That is a little known fact about Holly. And then Dave, um, Dave was a professional sailor, but not many people knew about his forest products business he did on the side. So in any event, they have been both uh, incredibly impactful on our work and also a tremendous amount of fun to be with. So we're delighted they both agreed to continue on our President's Advisory Council, and we look forward to seeing uh, more of you there. So thank you. And I also want to thank all of you for supporting us and uh, also uh, the countless volunteers who take care of our land and our ever-increasing membership, which makes all this possible. So I, I should mention that I really just hit the highlights there are additional projects that uh, I, some I didn't cover, and there's much more in the works. So I want to just take a minute and just see if there are any questions Kelly can share. If anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. We haven't had any questions, but so many comments about thanking Nellie for everything she did and thanking Dave and Holly for the tremendous leadership that they've had on the board. Great, well, in that case, um, I will turn it back to Dave for some remarks. Wow. Yeah, it's kind of a bittersweet um, night for uh, me. Last annual meeting as your board president, but uh, I think I speak for Holly and we're not going anywhere. Um, I just wanna say that you know, to serve this organization has truly been a joy, <clears throat> excuse me. I've never been a part of, uh, of a group as smart, dedicated, and passionate as this one. And that goes for both the board and the staff. <clears throat> the, uh, I really don't have the words to express the satisfaction that I've had working with Andy, Kelly, Megan, Max, Chris, and their teams. And I just also can't say enough about my fellow board members. You function at a um, very high level. And it's been my absolute privilege to be associated with you. I'm super excited for Fred Ben Sickle coming in as the board president. And I am very confident that he will lead us to new and higher levels. Congratulations, Fred. So once again, for everybody, thanks for joining us this evening. Thanks to you, Conserve Land and Healthy Lakes will be our legacy a special region to be enjoyed by everyone. I've, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, remind you that we are in our final straight stage of the capital campaign. We certainly welcome um, any participation or further participation in thanking you in advance for considering it. Uh, now, um, we can invite you to stay for a few minutes to watch a video of some of the highlights that your support enables us to do. And uh, with that, that'll be the end of the meeting. Once again, nice to see you all, at least on the screen. Just give me one second to share it. and the surrounding region 
will play an important part in our effort to get to carbon neutrality. And there's really nothing like trees and managed resources in the natural environment for achieving that. If you care about water, you have to care about the land that surrounds it. That means taking better care of the watersheds, reducing the amount of runoff that occurs, reducing the number of pollutants that move into our lakes. The work that we are doing in the Finger Lakes for water preservation is one of the most important jobs that we have. We're living in times when, uh, when climate concerns are real. We have the young children, we have to explain things to them, and they have some honest questions about the viability of the future. I like to help the environment. I like to help people make sure nature and people stay safe. So those things are really interconnected with each other. When someone chooses to join the land trust, what they're really doing is investing in making the area right, not just for ourselves, but for the generations that follow. It's a wonderful thing when you wake up and realize that maybe you can do something to contribute to things, staying pure and clean and open. And like you, I'm committed to protecting our lakes and our watersheds and preserving our lands so that we and future generations can enjoy a rich and thriving region. Our thriving, diverse wildlife needs thriving, diverse habitat. That's what the Land Trust does. I love nature and the land and having it be there and seeing around the world so much destruction. You can't deal with that scale, but here you can make a difference in a small area and a, a little difference here, you know, they add up. Everybody can make a difference. Let's make it better where we are. Let's make this area and its watershed as good as we can for as long as we can. You know, it's not going to take one magic bullet or two. It's going to take a system of magic bullets, right, including land use. And for us, it's important. It's really important. So vitally important. Absolutely critical because it can change in a heartbeat. Thanks, everybody. Good night, everybody. Thank you.